Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. As you know, we talked about this, but it doesn't escape me for one second that a series like this is so important for scholars that are building their ideas, that are still working on their ideas, um, that are not yet at a kind of institutional level, because there's much to be said about knowledge production. And much of my conversation today will be about knowledge production in terms of both my work and where I place my work. Um, and so it doesn't escape me for one second, but this is very much a part of that ongoing conversation. So thank you for the invitation and for allowing me to kind of think out loud on these ideas. Um, what I have today is just a series of kind of questions that I've been asking myself for a very long time and to kind of frame it in terms of how I came to these ideas. I wanted to start with asking myself, really, how did I get here in terms of how did I get to these questions um, and how did I get to thinking about questions of political violence, multi-scale or political violence, um, violence that's, that exceeds geographies, violence that exceeds place. Um, in terms of where I am now. And so, you know, I wanted to begin with my Toronto intellectual genealogy. Um, I was not born here. I was born in Pakistan. And I come from a community that is state targeted uh, in Pakistan. Um, for those that know, like any contemporary territorial nation state, it can actually hold the different groups of people that live within them. And Pakistan happens to be not only a former British colony, but has also been implicated into US empire for decades. And now increasingly is being implicated into Chinese variations of empire. Um, and while the version of a word empire may seem as a colonial kind of invitation, a colonial past, as we now know, of course, that we live in the colonial present. And that is very much where my work emerges um, and thinks through in terms of what does it mean to be here when I think about political violence. Um, and for me, we arrived um, by way of being smuggled across this Pakistani border, um, even though my family originally is from pre-partition India. So I'm a part of a generation of multiple generations in my family that are all displaced and dispossessed, whether by a British past or whether by a post-colonial Pakistani present um, into now as a refugee settler um, on this land. And so political violence in all of its formations chases the kind of questions um, and implicates me into these kind of sets of things that I will now ask of myself. Um, and I went to school here as well. I went to the University of Toronto in my undergrad. I did international relations and peace and conflict studies, which is in this building. Um, so I had lectures here. Um, and I, of course, came to that work because of the supposed framing of international relations as thinking about power, right? Political science always has this kind of gravitas in which it thinks it has control in terms of only we are the discipline that speaks about power in a particular kind of way. Now, of course, as we know, um, that kind of European genealogy and framing of power and violence was something that I was never a part of. And so I left that discipline and I came into human geography um, right after also at the University of Toronto, where my dissertation work was on drone warfare um, between US empire and between Pakistan itself, which now also produces drones. It buys them from China and Israel um, and therefore, we get this really messy web um, that exceeds these questions of coloniality, post-coloniality, empire, because so often in my work, I'm thinking about language that I don't yet have, right? Because whether it's, whether it's institutional, whether it's archival, whether it's disciplines in which we all work or are forced to kind of work in, we don't yet have that language that I need to grapple with the question that I'm asking. So much of this presentation, and by way of me situating myself into my Toronto genealogy is a really important part of, again, why I ask these certain set of questions. And I'll unravel them for you in terms of this really kind of short presentation that I have. And very specifically, when I think about the Toronto intellectual genealogy, I owe an incredible amount of intellectual debt to Caribbean radical thought. Not only is Toronto a heavily diasporic Caribbean city, Caribbean thought is foundational to contemporary radical thought in a way that I think escapes like literally my spirit, if I could convince someone like what you should be reading in the contemporary time it is Caribbean radical thought. And it has been so, so, so foundational to my thinking. I may come from a place called quote unquote Pakistan. I may come from a place called Asia and that has absolutely no bearing or relevance to the ways that I think about network violence that again escapes geography. And I think in particular because of this city but also because of those that have come through this city um, that again, I'll move into, they have been such foundational thinkers in which I worked in. 
And specifically, um, in terms of how I frame this for myself, is through transnational feminism. And transnational feminism, in the Toronto context, um, comes from M. Jackie Alexander. And Professor Jack, Jackie Alexander is Professor Emeritus now at the Women and Gender Studies Institute here at the University of Toronto. She is from Trinidad originally, and a lot of her work, and specifically her 2006 book, Pedagogies of Crossings, was a foundational work of theory that theorizes transnational feminism, not only through the Caribbean, but through Jackie's thinking about what does it mean to bring geographies together in the same sentence. And that training is now a part of, again, my formal work because in my visual studies master's now, I'm also a student of women general studies in a more formal way and being trained by transnational feminists like Professor Alyssa Trotz um, and Michelle Murphy, right? Who again are all thinking about questions of violence, but approach this question of violence not through a kind of, you know, in order to ask a question of violence, you must go to a certain archive and only then can you answer that question, right? I'm thinking about this in the most expansive sense, right? Because I think that kind of expansive sense is exactly why, for example, I've traversed so many different disciplines to still ask the same question because no single discipline could hold enough of what I needed. Um, and so to kind of move us forward, these are some key words that I've been thinking about for also a very long time um, that I will unravel, but I wanted to start with some of these like narration, questions of narration, questions of hauntings, questions of the everywhere, and eventually what I will move into is think about what do I mean by this edge of what I am thinking about in relation to Pakistan, but that also so exceeds that which is Pakistan. And so this story for me, especially in my kind of work so far, has started off with these two key dates, one which is June 19th, 2004, and the other date, which is March 2015. Now, on June 19, 2004 is the first official date in which the United States, um, who has for many decades now operated drones, and these drones in particular in 2004 was the MQ-1 drone called the Predator drone. And that Predator drone was built by Boeing and has since been not only experimented, weaponized, operationalized, not only in the geography of Pakistan, but in the Naga Desert in what is Palestine, in and across Okinawa, in Hawaii, in Latin America, um, in Guantanamo, in the Middle East. And so what we get from these specific dates is, again, this other expansive story, not of a singular location, but multiple locations, right? A webbed network of violence. And so for me, this question of, even though the US claims that the first drone strike in Pakistan was on June 19, 2004, we also know historically that this thing called drone that flies up in the sky, it's not a helicopter, it's not an airplane, it's not an airplane, it's a variation of the of two, has been tested since um, the Vietnam War, which was 1960s, 1970s. And even before the Viet even before the conflict of Vietnam, what we had was U.S. empire that since 1492, the arrival of quote unquote Columbus into not only the Caribbean has so dictated the kind of conquistador settler logic of violence that then gets implicated into the way that the U.S. operates. So the U.S. dropping a bomb on Pakistan in the zero state, specifically in the north, on June 19th, is not the best example because in the U.S. archive, it's that particular bomb drop that starts their intervention in Pakistan. But of course, many radical scholars have argued so much otherwise, that this, because you drop a bomb at a certain date, it doesn't mean the war started then, right? And Pakistan's partition was 1947 from the British. And even for Pakistan, its own introduction of who, it's, who it, it thinks it is, is implicated into centuries long of violence, right? And this comes from us again from the Caribbean, which since 1492, and even prior, 1444, um, with the arrival of the Portuguese to West Africa and Senegal before the transatlantic slave trade, we know that this network violence has taken different forms, but does not escape or leave the fact that someone dies in the end, right? The story is, may have different characters, but this ending of the story tends to usually be the same, right? Someone dies at the hands of power. And who those people are are all different and their histories are different and their cultures are different and who they are now are different. But somehow there's a kind of reoccurring repetition that just keeps reproducing itself, um, whether in the post colony, whether in the settler colony, whether in 1492, whether in the 18th century, there seems to be repetitions that just keep occurring. And the date of March 2015 is 
Pakistan's own experiment with its own drones that it brought from China. Um, and it was called the NESCOM Brock. And NESCOM is just one of the organizations that in Pakistan um, is a part of the US military. And its own version of Barak takes up um, the Islamic mythology story of how the Holy Prophet ascended to the heavens on this half steed, half winged creature called the Barak. So Pakistan named it its own Barak, uh, its own drone, after this word Barak, to mirror or mimic, I guess, this idea of some grand national narrative about who they think they were when they also started fighting back against quote unquote terror um, on their own land. And it wasn't. U.S. empire as the only empire that was inflicting violence on the land. And so for me, the question has always been, well, how do you hold not just U.S. empire as the usually overrepresented version of empire? I think we always get this story, especially because of where we are, that somehow U.S. empire must be the worst form of empire or is the only form of empire, right? Which doesn't allow us to ask questions like, why is a post-colony like Pakistan also dropping bombs on its own people? How did you get there? Where's the white man hiding behind the garden? Who's doing it, right? And this is a kind of question that I think has been so particularly haunting for me because it escapes a discipline. Not any single discipline can hold that question because some disciplines haven't gotten to thinking about US empire differently. American studies, Canadian studies. Um, I mean, I can go on forever. I just wish to say about disciplines. But there's certain ways in which we can't ask certain questions. And so for me in international relations when I was younger, that was a big part of it. They never tried to ask that question. Um, and I never needed them to, but I always pushed back and I did. Um, but it meant that certain ways of thinking were not enough to get to where we needed to go because the world around us and that which I see as a very real, tangible, blood and flesh world um, requires those questions to be asked, right? And so that's kind of where I set it up in this way is to think about these two key dates which are being mapped by two different countries in some certain ways, but are always aligning the real problem, right? Who are you after in this violence? And why are you doing this in this way that you are? And so to get us kind of going here, I was thinking about what Karen Kaplan, who is another foundational transnational feminist, um, or claims to be one, um, and has written a lot of work with Interpol Greywall, and Professor Kaplan is now at the University of California, San Diego, and her work has really thought about militarism on a global scale, on a scale that escapes the nation state, um, has called this kind of big turn to drones um, and fancy technology and war making um, as dronorama, right? This obsessive attention to, oh my God, a drone is here, a drone is there, everywhere's a drone. And so scholars chasing this drone figure, saying the same thing over and over again, US empire is really bad. U.S. empire is really bad. Oh, look, another strike. U.S. empire is really bad, right? Meanwhile, Israel, which has invented its own versions of drones, continues to dispossess and drop the exact same bombs bought from the U.S. on Palestinians and dispossesses them on the similar scale. So once again, this overrepresentation of the U.S. doesn't allow us to ask any other question except the U.S. is really bad, which we all know by this point, historically speaking, right? Um, and it's a story that I don't think needs to be retold over and over and over again. It is so built um, if you choose to listen and just attune yourself to those kind of radical histories that already exist that super exceed any form of enlightenment European canon, right? Um, that so many of us are constantly either speaking to or are forced to speak to just to make an argument to have someone understand or listen, right? And in another version of the story, Fred Moulton, who is a very foundational thinker from the, um, uh, the University of New York, i.e. NYU, in performance studies, has also talked about drones, but has said that cops are drones. So that drones now are not this fancy technology in the sky, but are people, embodied people, who commit murder, right, across different geographies. So what happens when Karen Kaplan is like, not only do we have a drone-orama, objects that are being fantasized um, in studies, but rather Fred Moulton flips it and says, well, no, actually, there's, a, there's drones all around us. They don't need to fly in the sky at all because the structure between this thing called drone in the sky and the cop on the ground is the exact same, right? Violence workers, violence makers. The form changes, but the structure doesn't, right? And so that's essentially where in my kind of graduate work then I was thinking about, well, again, how do you hold that? 
this mass network of items that is not about certain objects or certain people or certain places, but is somehow all connected, right? Which again, from the Caribbean, this is a foundational, foundational theorizing point, right? Is that because of the fact that the Caribbean has had such a violent history, it is required to think about the world on a scale that other disciplines or other geographies are sometimes not asked to, right? So it's always easier for someone like me to be like, well, Pakistan is in the South of Asia. There's no such thing as South of Asia because when you're in Pakistan, it's just Pakistan. There's no South of Asia, right? That's again, a US military term during the Cold War that emerged to label geographies through a certain kind of understanding of the world through the US. So for me now, when I'm asked about, well, how do you place your work? Usually I get asked, well, are you a South Asian scholar? And I was like, not on my life. But the fact that you're reading me into that shows the way that people are thinking about these questions, not as expansive questions, but as enclosed, just because I accidentally am born in a place called Pakistan, which is not good enough, right? For any of these questions, it's like, it doesn't matter where you're born. That's not a question, right? That's the fact of by accident. I didn't choose to be there. No one asked me when I was born if I wanted to be over there. I just kind of was. And I happened to be mapped called Pakistan. Um, but that all exceeds, you know, a kind of individualistic kind of choice, right? And so the versions of drones that now we know, um, and this is a really quick Google search because I'm always curious about what comes up when you type in the word drone. It's usually a mix between the Amazon drones that you can buy for 70 bucks um, for photography. So when you go to, I don't know, Hawaii, you want to take fancy pictures. Um, you take your own little drone and you don't think about the entire legacy or history in which that particular drone from Amazon comes from, which is ironically enough, also placed with other versions of drones, like the MQ-1 over here, which is the military drone, right? That I was talking about earlier, or the one up there, which has now been replaced by the MQ-1 Reaper drone, um, a kind of more weaponized version with more fancy tech and more fancy cameras and more fancy bombs. Um, but the idea is the same, that it doesn't matter that the form of the drone is this, but somehow this also leads to this. Right, this entire engineering process that goes behind drones and technology that's all related to each other, but in these objects, seems like it's not related to each other. How could that big airplane that carries bombs be related to this thing? But of course it is. Um, and of course it's made to be in a way which these connections get removed as such to operationalize and normalize the kind of violence, which is that they all exist when we know this, right? People on the ground know this. But it's the fact that you have to convince someone to be like, well, no, actually, there are connections here. I'm sorry. It's just not obvious. Obvious in quotations, right? And so we come back to this word drone as this container term that still can't do what I need you to do, which is to be able to account for these network connections of violence. So again, if you return to back to Karen Kaplan, there is this drone around now, chasing the figure of the drone thinking that somehow next time or tomorrow, you'll know more about it because now you know that it's dropped a bomb somewhere else in Somalia or it's dropped, dropped a bomb somewhere else in Palestine. Now that you have these, all, all these fancy geographies, somehow you can do more, ask more about this figure called drone, right? And so for me, ultimately what I'm really chasing in these questions and some a question that I've been asking since my undergraduate here in international relations, unfortunately, is what does, quote, violence unravel in the way that we tell stories, right? Because violence is not just about accounting for violence. I'm not interested in sitting at a United Nations Security Council meeting to discuss the next time a drone is going to be dropping another bomb that we might not know where it dropped because there's no quote unquote archive, right? Um, I'm not interested in the institutional state versions of stories that the US is eliminating terror because it has dropped three additional bombs with collateral damage where 15 faceless, nameless people have died. Um, even though those people argue otherwise, that those are people of our family, that they have names and they have faces. So what is this violence really doing? And whose story are we listening to when we say violence? And whose story, of course, are you going to silence in that asking of that question, right? So when I say unraveling, I literally mean the unraveling of the beginning, the middle, and the end, the characters of this plot, of this story, who they are, who they're not, who they might be, 
because for me, so much of this work um, up until now, so far in my life, has been a series of unravelings, right? Not being able to ask that question that I really want to ask and not sure why, or being forced to ask other questions that are not enough, right? That don't spiritually move me when I know that why someone like me might do this work is not because I enjoy it, but because there's a spiritual dimension of asking these questions. And asking and getting somebody else to say yes that that fundamental question is important in the work that you're doing in relation to everyone else's work right and so again this question is something that comes back to me i don't even have the language necessarily to to be able to hold what it is i'm saying here but this was the temporary kind of placeholder question i asked myself um but always it's not enough right this is just the beginning so what I'm hoping to do now from here is just to keep unraveling, right? And see how far this unraveling will go. And so to unravel this, we start with this cartographic map, unfortunately. And this cart cartographic map is supposed to be of this place called Asia. And in this place called Asia, there are many different countries um, that all have lines, that all have borders drawn. And if you ask the US why they draw, why they use drones to draw bombs, they say that this particular line, which is the Joran line, um, historically the kind of leaky border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, is filled with terror. And they say to make sure that we don't have terror and we have you know, global security, human rights, we need to just bomb these people because they're a problem. And so we're gonna bomb, and usually the drones that the US operates and Pakistan operates are always drop, dropped in this kind of line. Ironically enough, the same border that was drawn by the British, the Durand line, because the term Durand um, comes after um, the person who crafted that treaty, right? Durand is an English name, Pakistan doesn't speak, um, or its national language is not English, even though many people do speak English now. So for me, this questioning of unraveling violence starts with these containers that we are forced to reckon with, right? Because they supposedly exist. But again, that violence exceeds this one container, just across from this um, line that I'm speaking of is, of course, um, Pasta in West Asia, very, very close and shares a very, very important history with continental Asia because when the British split um, the region here, which was the British Raj in 1947, into these three countries from the British, Palestine was split six months just after this part of the split. Then Israel became what is Israel and Palestine became West Gaza. Uh, sorry, Gaza in the West Bank, right? Under the same rubric of British territorial management, right? Because the British couldn't manage them anymore. You were going through a period of decolonization um, with different countries asking for different demands. And this was happening not only in Asia, but especially in Africa and especially in Latin America continentally. And so there were questions about how to manage this kind of, in the British US eyes, chaos, right? Which absolutely was not chaos. It was just because they did not know how to read the situation. Um, but for them, again, it gets read a certain way. And for us as scholars, and you know, again, for those of us that work across different geographies are always asked, therefore, are you a South Asian scholar? Because your work is on Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it's always that question of being like, well, no, why can't you do anything beyond a certain measure of what your work should be? Just because you think it's easier to read me in that way. But I certainly don't call myself a South Asian scholar at all. I think it'd be a nightmare to be called that. Um, on any kind of scale when the work demanded is so different than being forced to be asked are you from over here and is that why your work is over here right so that's the first unraveling a personal kind of where are my kind of spiritual questions guiding me right because they don't guide me to a certain geography they don't guide me to a certain set of people but it, ha it happens and it exists so where am i going with this right so this is the first unraveling and the second unraveling of course is um by a poet, Habib Jalib, who was considered in Pakistan a very kind of feisty poet who would talk back to a post-colonial nation state, um, who at that time, especially during the Cold War period with the US, was going through its own foundational question of who are we as a post-colonial country that has all these different people, all these different cultures, all these different religions, supposed to be trying to live together, but it's not working. So who are we, right? And so Habib Jalib, the poet asked, what then is Pakistan? What then is this mapped country called Pakistan? Really, what is it, right? 
And something that I was thinking about as well in relation to this question of what then is Pakistan um, is a direct quote from my I mean, dissertation in which I ask, I'm especially concerned with the ethical dimensions of struggling to narrate through language the shattered war landscape of Pakistan's Western borderlands with Afghanistan condemned and labeled by many North Atlantic governments like the settler United States as quote, monstrous violent people and quote, barbarous nations. And that comes from Sylvia Winter who is a foundational Jamaican philosopher um, who of course has seen a, you know, a recent turn in her work across many disciplines in a somewhat dangerous way because her work is so expansive and requires you to really sit with her work. And I'm still doing that. Um, I came across her work three years ago, but she is a foundational, again, Caribbean radical thinker um, who helps us ask different sets of questions, right? Or who helps us with language that we all are looking for, but in different ways for a different set of questions. And so it brings me ultimately in this unraveling to questions of knowledge production and to questions of institutional disciplines um, that I think I already kind of um, gotten myself into, but ultimately in my in most of my work, when I ask the question on unraveling the violence, I'm thinking about analytical enclosures. I'm thinking about methodological questions. I'm thinking about why I can't ask certain questions and why can I ask certain questions? How am I being trained and who am I being trained by? Right, and this is a scholarly institutional question. Um, but this is the kind of work that then gets spread to other people beyond the academy. Um, of course, I'm from Rexdale and I am the first in my family to go to university. And my mom doesn't, you know, ask me to be like, what are you doing? What are you doing today? Like, what is your work about? But the fact that there is a mistranslation happening between the fact that we can't even talk about this work, even if I translate it into Urdu, which is my primary language of instruction with her, is to think about there's already gaps happening way before a question is being asked, right? Especially a question that I think in her life has consumed her in different ways, right? And her family in different ways. Um, I happen to be fluent in English. And therefore, I can ask certain set of questions and communicate and translate in a way that she might not. That doesn't mean that she's not asking those sorts of questions. It just means I happen to be that randomly fortunate person who had a particular kind of institutional training um, to be able to do that. And for me, of course, again, as I think about violence, I'm thinking about questions against recuperation. And by recuperation, I mean things like, let's do a survey to see how many bombs were dropped in Pakistan in this day or in this time, right? There's a certain turn in violent studies, which I broadly call violent studies, that somehow if you have more data on who died, when and where, right? That that will help get us to an answer out and beyond violence. Once I know how many people were killed in this war, I now know from a data perspective, analytical perspective, now we have an answer, right? Not thinking at all, of course, about all of that that leaks beyond any form of counting, anything that leaks outside of formal documenting violence, archiving violence. Um, and again, so much work has already been done by radical thinkers, right, on this, that the archive is not a place to look for these answers because there's no place to go from there, right? It will always lead you to a dead end, a cycle of endless counting. Oh, look, another bomb being dropped in Pakistan. 15 people died today, and tomorrow 20, and then 25. But what does all this counting of numbers of those that have died do for us when we contend with the fact that they were in flesh and blood, right? They weren't in data. They were datafied and quantified, but they are people. And then of course, always because of the geographies that I'm working within and from, I'm working on stolen imperial land always. Um, that place that we called Canada, probably with three Ks. Um, but that is the ultimate thinking about what it means to work then from a settler colony and then ask these questions of violence when I know there's violence all around us. And when I say violence, of course, here I'm defining it in this broadest context. You don't need a war with a tank to say today is violence, right? We know this. There's so many other layered forms of violence that again, in the questions that I ask, I'm really trying to think about how to hold them all together because they are not separated um, from each other, right? but they are often made to be separated from one another because it's easier to understand or it's easier to make an argument or it's easier to talk to the UN, right? Which are not necessarily any of my concerns, primarily with this work. Um, and so it brings us to one of the kind of foundational 
organizers on the ground that emerged in um, 2014, which was the Pashtun Tahapuz movement, which broadly speaking translated just means the protection movement. Um, and the Pashtuns are the ethnic community that live along the borderlands of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And during the British were split into what is territorially Afghanistan and what is territorially Pakistan, but have always had crossings and families and relations across one another, right? And so when this Pashtun Tapas movement was being founded, one of its core members, um, who actually has a very active now Twitter and Facebook kind of archive, you can say, where he's going out to different events, meeting with people and talking about this violence that's happening in Waziristan, whether it's drones or whether it's the Pakistani army. And he says things like in his public talks in Pakistan, which is very dangerous, to take the names of the Pakistani intelligence services, which is the ISI and the MI. The ISI is the Inter-Services Intelligence of Pakistan, the current, um, which we can call a variation of the FBI, with a handful of money from the FBI to do this work. And MI, the Military Intelligence separate um, office for the Pakistan Army. And what he's doing here when he talks about these two intelligence services out loud in this particular um, rally that he's in in 2018, he says, saying these names of these organizations, the ISI and MI, are considered, quote, grand sins akin to being wajib al qutb which basically means worthy of being murdered, right? Saying the names of these secret services, police services, is equivalent to death right, in this context, because the consequences are so grave when you speak against a post-colony like Pakistan, which is being marred by a series of different political investments and capital investments, right, that are all rotating around this word terror, right, as the only imagination possible within supposedly this country, right, that being untrue. But what Manzoor Pashtin, the person who I'm quoting here from this rally is saying, is that I am mentioning your name out in the open and I will shout it out loud, right? And there's a kind of work here happening, is that you are willing to put that level of, what you can say visibility, right? To say the names out loud at a rally in the territorial container of the country that doesn't want you to say that. Um, that is heavily surveilling you, that has barbed wires, that has tanks, that has guns, that has bombs. And so what does it mean for those people that live on the ground? that are not accounted for, right, in this violence because they can't be tallied up in a survey, right? But they exist and they say things that far exceed, right, what is being said here about that same kind of violence, right? From the US perspective, this is not being said, right? What is being said is it's like, this country must be full of X terror or this country must be, quote, a failed state, which is the usual popular language in international relations as a discourse to speak to an entire country of 181 million people and tell them you've somehow failed, right? Um, but again, we see Pashtin pushing back on that dominant narrative of violence, which is to say that not only do we have a voice in this way, but no matter how dangerous it is, we also have a particular kind of language to name that violence as such, right? And so in my own kind of thinking now, to bring this further in my own writing, was to think about this question of language that always came up about like, what does it mean to like name this language? And a series set of different scholars who have already been working on this in different disciplines. So for example, Horton Spillers, who is a foundational, I wouldn't say black studies because I don't think she would agree. Um, she is a really senior scholar in what may be called um, formerly black studies, but in her work, she's been very aware of the limitations of what it means to have disciplines, right? And in her work, she thinks about questions like, we need wait no longer for a crisis to inspire a renewal. We're up to our neck in crises. And what Spurs is saying there, of course, is that, as I was saying earlier, this wide networked violence, right, is everywhere and there are all crises. So what we don't need is another survey, right? What we don't need is an archive that somehow just keeps counting these same deaths. Oh, look, another drone strike. Today, tomorrow, next week, and the weekend. And people otherwise, like Christina Sharp, who is professor of humanities here at York University, again, a very foundational thinker, says, I'm struggling to find the language for this work, to find the form of this work, and where language and form fracture more every day, right? And then finally, to come to another foundational thinker is Vina Das. She's a professor at, um, professor of anthropology at John Hopkins, um, 
and her book was called Life in Words, which I think is quite fitting. And she says, if the process of naming the violence presents a challenge, it is because such naming has large political stakes and not only because language alters in the face of violence. So we can see a whole genealogy, right, of different people at different times still thinking about this question about what is violence and how do we hold this violence together um, in this way. And this was a video of FKA Twigs, who is a British um, artist. And this particular video is called, How Is That? And this was a kind of visual representation of what one of my key, one of the key questions I was thinking about um, along with three quotes that I offered, which was this unraveling, right? If language isn't enough to capture the violence that I want to capture, is there some other way that somebody else might be able to capture that same question? And for me, this work when I first saw it, this is a 2013 video, it's very old now, but it's, I think, quite an important um, part of her work. And so I just wanted to play it. Um, it's very short, but I think the visual dimensions of the question I was asking are implicated out on this particular video in a very eerie, but I think complementary way. So I'll just play that. Yeah, let's talk there. But essentially, in the way that I think FKA Twig is able to visualize this collapsing, this collapsing, this refraction, this overlapping of this figure of the body in some way, right? Unnamed, faceless. And it keeps bending, it contorts, it moves. And so when we think about violence, this is the kind of scale that we're thinking about, about right? Not only the body, but what happens to the body in violence, which again, always is escaping our language, right? So when the first time I came across this song in particular, I was just so enamored by the visual. Um, and of course, the song, of course, keeps repeating, how does that feel? How does that feel? Which is also very relevant. But thinking about how this figure of this body is being pulled in different directions all the time, right? Um, and of course, on the one hand, you know, having an embodied experience to a war or violence like I do in this way, I'm sure allows me to gravitate towards it in a particular way, but also at the same time, I use this as a key example because people are still thinking about these questions, right? Whether or not you have the language, but there's a visual language here um, in which it's enough to see what scales we're trying to capture, right? A constant movement, constant violence um, without necessarily even knowing where this might be going. Oh, I think I'm good. Um, I'm just going to skip a couple because of time um, and move into kind of the conclusion in terms of where this is all going for me and what's leading. It leads us back towards Sylvia Winter, who I really briefly really quoted um, when she was thinking about monstrous enemies. And in a conversation between uh, Sylvia Winter and Badur Alagra. Badur actually graduated from U of T. She did her uh, degree in political science and international relations. And then she went off to do a master's at LSE um, with Paul Gilroy and then finished her PhD in, at Brown in Africana Studies with Anthony Bowes. Um, and Anthony Bowes in particular is known to be a really important scholar for Sylvia Winter. Um, he is also working within Caribbean radical imagination and Caribbean radical thought. And this conversation between Badur and Sylvia Winter um, is a short one that was published in 2020 for Offshoot Journal. And in this conversation, there was a point where Sylvia Winter is speaking back to Badur's question and says, now, if we once again use the language of the virus, she's talking about COVID um, at the time this interview was being done, we can see that, yes, we are one species. So the differences we see are a result of a system, are the result of an imposition of language and that is where the transformation must be made and achieved. The only cure will be a transformation of the whole society and an entirely new knowledge order altogether. Otherwise, Winter says, we will remain trapped in this, right? And for those that know kind of Winter's really, really expansive thinking, you know that she's thinking particularly about um, the arrival of Columbus in 1492 to the Caribbean, but what becomes the Americas, right? continentally speaking. And Winter is thinking not about an isolated series of events, 
but as this entire system that comes about that we now call modernity or the modern, right? Post 1492 in the Americas that are an imposition of language. So whether it's race that comes about also in that interaction between Columbus and the Americas, but also now what we have that we might, have, that which I call violence, right? Is this constant circular thinking about language, language, language. Where is the language that we need to explain the violence that we know or that we see or that we feel or that we know spiritually to exist, right? And Winter ends up becoming this kind of foundational thinker to anchor all of this as a connecting bridge, right? Between all these different sets of thoughts and questions that I may have put on the table, but to think about all of them as always connected, always as a system, right? And that system has different moving parts, but they all rely on each other to make it work. Yeah, so that's winter. And of course, to kind of return back to why I'm framing this particular kind of conversation in this way is always think about how there's so many different versions of hauntings and ghosts that we now know. Um, those that which I call violence, but obviously those that exceed violence, right? Um, but that's, I think, what helps us to move towards this edge that I'm after, this edge of thought through winter or this edge of Pakistan to escape this insularity that exists within knowledge production, um, in the academy especially, that which exists in disciplines, that which is exists in asking a certain set of questions and therefore not others. Um, and so I you know, put a lot on the table in terms of expansive thought, but this is what it always does to me is that it always leaves me unraveled. Um, and if I've done my kind of you know job in this way, then I hope you equally feel as unraveled um, as I always do, because there's no way to kind of bring this together in a neat, tidy form or story. So thank you.